Hello and welcome to a Kingdoms of Britonia rundown on the Barefoot Miniatures channel. Today I'm going to be going over, as I said, Kingdoms of Britonia and there'll be an additional video for the Arcane Journal. If you want the Arcane Journal now, along with other The Old World guides, they will be available immediately on Patreon and the Arcane Journal will be available in a couple of days on general release. Also, you'll get, for joining to the Patreon, an RSS link to a podcast feed version of these videos, ad-free videos and early release games as well. And I've done that just because the guide, actually I've recorded this at the end, got to about two and a half, three hours long, including the Arcane Journal. So I've just had to segment it up a bit. Yeah, the main list for Bretonians is obviously centered around hard-hitting knights and low-quality chaff peasants. Um... And that's going to be the main two dynamics that we'll be sort of balancing off each other today. Like I've tried both styles of list. Um, one that's very knight-centric and has bar knights barreling down the table in a new lance for a new old lands formation. Um, as well as actually, I've been experimenting with how to make a very peasant-centric list, which can then contrast to the knights that actually have to be included in the army. So for the army, you've got not to one duke. Now that's like a hard limit. You can't get any more than that regardless of point size. Then not to one baron or prophetess per thousand points. So if you're playing 2000 points, you can have a duke, a baron and a prophetess. But whether or not you want to actually include all of that will obviously be a different matter. Because moving on to the third column, you're going to have uh, paladins, damsels, sergeants at arms. Now, there's a bit of discussion between is a level two worth it over having a level four. Um, personally, I'm favoring level four, so that's the prophetess over level twos at the moment. But the paladin, I'd say, is a definite include because of the, the box at the bottom right, which is that you get a battle standard bearer at no additional cost for the upgrade to Battle Standard Bearer, which is a an excellent little special rule um, and just continues from previous iterations of Bretonians. And if you have any peasants, I'd say a Sergeant at Arms for the amount of cost it is, is just an excellent, excellent upgrade. Now, for the core choices, you're gonna have to have one plus Knights of the Realm versus Foot Knights, uh, Mounted Knights of the Realm versus Knights of the Realm on Foot. And that's going to be one of the discussion points that we have today. Um, and then one plus units of men at arms or bowmen. And there's a bit of toss up in that. Like these bowmen are quite good. They're quite cheap. But I think men at arms are actually incredibly, incredibly good. And we'll be going into that later. So let's just dive on into the list. And I'll go through sort of relevant special rules as we get to them. So... So the chivalrous vows, we're going to immediately run up against this into dukes and paladins and stuff, and that'll carry on through the list. So I thought I'd do that first. Basically, the knight's vow means that peasants within six of your knights um, don't cause panic checks if they're destroyed, because no one cares about peasants, right? Or if the knights have fled through. And you can't be joined by a character with a peasant special rule. I mean, it would be nice when, when we get to the Sergeant at Arms. It would be nice to be joined by one. But it makes sense, right? Questing Vow means that you can reroll failed fear, panic and terror. Uh, as well as having the other benefits of the Knight's Vow. However, you can't be equipped by with a lance. So basically, you're just stuck with great weapons. Maybe an Ogre Blade on your... Um, Baron or Duke, Paladin even. Oh, I suppose Paladin can't take over Blade at too many points, but that, that sort of thing, you just can't have a lands which is just fitting for questing knights. And then Grail Vow, you get immune to psychology, magical attacks, which will help against Ethereal, um, ignore some wards, like I believe demons get their wards ignored by magical attacks. And you've got the Stubborn Special Rule, which is very useful if you are losing combats. Now, that's something that I would think most of the time you don't want to be losing combats 
with the lance formation because it would very quickly get your lance blunted and we'll go over that a bit later uh you can only be joined by a character with that also has this chivalrous vow if it's a unit or a handmaid and a lady and you cannot be join a unit of peasantry unless you have and that's for all of them unless you have the virtue of empathy which we'll get into when we go over virtues so yeah fairly standard you can't join knights of a higher value than you if you are a character uh, you can't join peasantry peasantry jo can't join you and then you have little bits depending on the level to play with your leadership so the general special rules is blessings of the lady um, and I, I'd say it's going to be very much an edge case where you're not going to use this special rule. This special rule is absolutely excellent. Um, so once deployment's complete, instead of rolling for first turn, you can just choose to go second, uh, and your knights start praying, and you gain a six up ward against all wounds inflicted, or a five up against strength five or higher. Now, strength five or higher is a really, it's a very good points level to start getting this five up. Because great weapons and lances, as well as flails, with anything but a strength 2 creature, will strike at strength 5s. And that's the sort of things that tend to ignore armor saves. Or, yeah, ten, tend to get higher on the AP values, should I say, at that level. Like, and obviously strength 6, if the, you, the base strength is 4, will be at that ward save of 5 as well. Um... If you ever start falling back, you do lose that blessing, but or if you refuse a challenge. Now, it's not something that I really see coming into it a massive amount. I sort of tend to nail my characters down into enemy characters and really try and like take them out or force them not to want to have to declare a challenge because Bretonian characters are actually very good. Um, so I don't actually have that happening too often. Now, obviously, your Knights of the Realm or something might run away questing and... Oh, well, questing are less likely to with the reroll, and Grails are immune to psychology, so won't run away from panic only if you've lost. And once you've lost that combat, it's sort of... You're regathering ground somewhere else anyway, and it's not too... It's obviously a bit a downside to lose the ward, but that unit's already been broken, and you're probably going to have taken casualties... So it's not, like, earth-shatteringly bad. Finest Warhorses, this comes on all Bretonian-level Warhorses, uh, or Bretonian Knight-level Warhorses. You can reroll ones on the charge, which is really good for getting those max-length charges. Like, when you declare a charge at 17 inches with your swift stride and your Warhorses movement with a charge roll, rerolling the ones, you're already quite likely to get that maximum charge because of swift stride topping up the other dice now when you're also re-rolling ones it just gives you that extra chance to pull off these maximum length charges uh, so that you're getting the charge rather than your opponent which is obviously really good the lands formation um which is obviously going into the triangle that's really good because all of your front rank fights it does have a point where it stops being a benefit and starts being it does have a point where your ranks versus the amount on the outside adding to the lance's number of attacks sort of the cost of it gets too high i think um and let's go into let's go into the lance now i was going to do it sort of at the end because that's where it was placed but that seems a bit of a silly place to place it right so the lance you deploy with a single model at the front then two then three then four like bowling ball pins um and basically everything counts as in contact with the enemy when you charge it, it sort of doesn't matter that your command group models are there where they are um a unit with the lands formation may not turn or redress the ranks but may wheel and move backwards as as normal when it wheels it's measured from the second rank so you actually have this very maneuverable unit of models because the width of your lance is only 60 millimeters wide uh, rather than say a front rank of 525 millimeters is 125 millimeters wide so that's you're actually less than half of a of a ranked up unit 
on regular human sized bases in width so you wheel really easily now in combat you only have to make the the first knight in the lance contact and then you become engaged you get a rank bonus for each rank that contains enough models for its troop type so in this case that when you have 10 models you're going to get a rank bonus of one which is what it is um you do however get plus one combat res for being in the lance formation and some units also has close order formation so that's going to be just a standard plus two to your combat res which is already good right it's it sort of balances out it being quite expensive to get a full rank bonus when you charge its flank you become blunted so blunt in the lance your front rank cannot make base contact with the enemy, say your charge is disrupted by terrain or something like that. You make a disordered charge, or you are charged and cannot perform a counter charge. So if you're outside of your enemy's movement value, you'll be able to perform your counter charge that all Bretonians have. Now, if you're inside their movement value, you won't be able to perform it and your lands will become blunted and you'll basically rank up um, like the old square Bretonian formation from 6th to 8th edition. Is that so terrible? No, I don't think so. Obviously, it's it's a narrow front rank, but you've been caught out. There should be a downside to the lands formation, and this is it. It's it's not massively ruined my game plans. It has, like, is to to be completely honest, it's just a rule that is, and it also allows you to. The, the triangular lands actually to work in a game of squares. I do think this was actually a needed rule. So I've been viewing the lances as best when having, say, between six to maybe eight models. And that might be a bit of a weird number considering that to get the, the rear rank is ten. Now six is the most sort of optimal number because you're only wait, wasting one model's attacks by being in the center of the third rank and it means that you get five out of the six fighting seven models will mean that one is pushed over to one side of the lance um and will also get to attack now eight you can take a casualty and still have that dude on the back fighting so that's how i've sort of been thinking about the numbers in the lance because once you get to the fourth rank which is the the four knights you're going to be paying for four knights to get the attacks of two knights so like the return on investment is it much lower than say just a broad fronted unit of knights where i've with my chaos been up to eight or nine wide in my front rank sort of charge of faramir style and all of those knights are, are striking so if you are going to that level of 10 knights although it's very wide I mean, try out a, a full rank of knights until you get Grail knights. Not so much, but are you, are you going to run ten Grail knights? I don't, I don't know. Except in very large games. So, yeah, my thoughts on the lands formation: very manoeuvrable, very good. Gets the static combat res bonus for the the lands formation, as well as a fair number of knights actually able to strike. Like six out, five out of six, um, seven out of eight knight striking and then 10 you get seven striking so he's just i suppose playing about with what you want in your lance but i've been stri sticking to sixes and sevens so back onto the special rules finally we have peasantry so if you within six of a friendly not model with the knights questing or grail vow uh, but just to drop it in slightly here but not the outcasts vow if that unit is not fleeing, you can use that knight's leadership characteristic. In addition, a standard uh, carried by a model with a special rule isn't counted as a trophy of war. Now this, this bit of the peasantry rule is very good uh, because basically it means that my unit of mounted yeoman, where I normally wouldn't put a standard in my fast cav unit because it would then end up giving away a significant portion of that unit's cost additional just by having the standard so for example my chaos marauder horseman when i'm playing my chaos list they don't take a standard because it's a 100 point unit that will give away 150 points if their standard gets taken out uh, whereas peasants i can take 
the Mounted Yeoman and they don't give away that additional standard victory points for the Trophies of War. So I think that's really good. It also means that you can throw them on archers or throw them on en like anything so long as you've got the points. Archers may not be worth it though. <laughs> it was just the one that sprang to my head. So into the, the characters section. So we've got the Duke, who's weapon skill seven, uh, negligible ballistic skill, strength five, toughness four, four wounds, initiative five, five attacks, leadership nine. Uh, and for 175 points, he's very close to Chaos Lord levels of good. Like, I mean, he's missing out on a toughness from a Chaos Lord, but other than that, all of the relevant stats are two Chaos Lord levels. And it's he'll come inbuilt with the Grail Vow, so he gets a five up ward, or four, six up, five up ward. Um, he has Blessings of the Lady if you pray. Although I suppose actually with the Grail Vow, we'll get that all the time. And he'll have Rallying Cry, so that any units within his command range that are running away can re-roll to rally, which is an, a very good like boost for the Duke. Now the Baron is weapon skill 6, strength toughness 4, 3 wounds, initiative 5, 4 attacks, leadership 9. And for 100 points, I actually think it's a really good character because again, it comes inbuilt with... The Blessing of the Lady. All knights come with the Blessing of the Lady. It's a great special rule. I'm going to maybe accidentally keep saying it <laughs> all the way through. But yeah, comes with the Knight's Vow and can be upgraded to purchase the Questing or Grail Vow. And the Paladin is also Weapon Skill 6. Just has two wounds though instead of the three wounds. Initiative 4 rather than 5. Three attacks. Uh, leadership 8. Now... Although that stat line is down, it's, it is 40 points less than the Baron. And the Baron is quite is good. But with having a free battle standard upgrade on the Paladin, I would 100% say that's worth it to take um, in any army. In, in any army. Because it's an additional combat res for free. Even if it's nothing else, even if it's not worth anything for you re-rolling to charge it's still a free additional combat res. And when we see in like just a second what you can put on that standard, it sort of really starts popping off. And they also, both of them, the Barons, have the Rallying Cry special rule. Now, would what would I upgrade them with? So, if they're on a horse, I would definitely give them lances unless obviously you've got the questing vow the and that's because of the ap minus two and the ability to use your lance and discard it and use something else in the next round is very good if you're on foot i actually do quite like the morning star the plus one strength and minus one ap all the time is solid it's a real solid weapon and for only three points then you can invest your magical items elsewhere I would tend to go with that. Now, all of which can take magical items at various levels, um, and you can take knight's vows on different ones, and obviously mounts. So knight's vows, we'll go through these now, because this is the main area where you might want to use them. So you've got the virtue of knightly temper for 70 points. During a turn in which you've charged, you gain extra attacks, D3, and Hatred, all enemies, special rule. Um, it's a it's an, a very expensive one, but if you want a massively hitty character, 70 points, putting this on a Duke, on a Hippogriff, say, just ensures that you will be decimating units because you've got the extra D3. You could put, say, an Ogre Blade on your Lord, so he's doing D3 wounds, Per attack done. Hatred for all the hits. So you can get five attacks. Um, and it's just really... It is really good. It's just whether you can pinch the points to get there. Because I think there are some lower cost ones. You can basically make good characters without spending so many points. The Virtue of Heroism for 60 points. Gaining the Monster Slayer special rule can be very useful. However, if you want a character that takes out monsters... Having a, your Duke on a Hippogriff 
with an ogre blade and the virtue of knightly temper will be much more all round uh, with the extra attacks d3 meaning that you can have up to eight attacks that each do d3 wounds and will also be very useful against units just to sheer volume of attacks when we're looking at this points level of virtue however with getting killing blow only on sixes i don't think it's frequent enough like yes you can you can get the sixes but just my personal taste is that i don't especially when wards and stuff are included i don't think you'll be getting that number off frequently enough to be worth 60 points over investing in say knightly temper and an ogre blade the virtue of stoicism now for 55 points a model with this virtue may re-roll the 2d6 when making a break test essentially this gives you a second battle standard bearer just in a more localized area so if you've got a big unit of knights that you want on a flank this or say you want your battle standard bearer on a flank uh, if you've got a unit in the center or away from that battle standard bearer this is incredibly useful. Um, I've been using something like this in my unit of foot knights because I might want my battle standard bearer mounted and it means that they're much more solid in like ju in just their defense because it's re-rolling the 2d6 and falling back in good order is sometimes actually what you want to do rather than having a battle standard bearer with a magic item that makes you give ground which we'll go into in a second now on to the next one we've got the virtue of the penitent and there's there's a few different ones of these um and i don't even know whether it's worth going through ev every single virtue but a few different ones that mean that your character has to be either on their own or not the general and a large boost to that character now these are obviously going to have to be what you weigh up if you're taking a hippogriff character or even like a paladin on uh, Pegasus. Because, say, a paladin on Pegasus has it with the virtue of the ideal. You can't be the general, which is fine anyway. Don't say you can't be the battle standard bearer. So you could have the a Pegasus knight, battle standard bearer, can't be the general, or join a friendly unit, but you've got an 18-inch bubble of battle standard radius, which is really good. Um... The Impetuous Knight, I don't really like gaining Impetuous. I don't like losing control of my units. For 35 points, you've got the Virtue of Audacity. May re-roll failed to hit rolls made against an enemy with higher weapon skill than yours. Now, this will only come off a, a couple of times a game, I imagine. Because even with weapon skill... What is it? Weapon skill 5 on your Paladin. Or if you're going any higher than that, 6 on anyone else... There is a, there's generic magic items that for cheaper allow you to re-roll your hits for one turn so and doesn't use up your virtue because you can have one virtue or multiple magic items. So it depends where your balance of magic item versus virtue, virtue points are allocated um, and also how many points you want to pay for your virtue. The virtue of purity, if you're planning on not praying at the start of the game is good so this is more one for an outcast list i would say where you can't pray at the start of the game uh, it's in the main list but there's going to be very few times where you don't want to pray with bretonians the virtue of duty um, unless the army general has been moved as a casualty it may claim plus one combat res uh, can it be your army's general or join a friendly unit? Now, this, again, hippogriff style, um, pegasus style virtue. If you want something like this, though, I mean, it's th this doesn't stand out to me as the greatest one because your single character, yes, needs to do a lot of wounds to beat an enemy unit, but really, you're going to be trying to assassinate a wizard with that character or kill War Machine crew or even take on another monster. And if you can just get your battle standard bearer within range of that character, I don't really care about losing that combat as much as I do in previous editions. The virtue of the joust, 
You may re-roll all failed to rolls to wound when using a lance. 20 points. I've not found myself using it, but it might be useful if you've got a monster hunting unit of knights. Because 20 points to re-roll ones, I'm not too sure in versus, say, 20 points spent elsewhere. Like re-rolls to hit on all of my characters' attacks. Now, virtue of confidence, you must always issue and accept challenges and may re-roll fails to hit rolls in those challenges. I actually quite like this for some of the unit champions that can take virtues, like the Grail Knight champion. So I've recorded this a couple of times, or this exact sentence a couple of times to try and get it right. And it's, I can't vocalise why I don't much like this all the time other than those unit champions. It just feels like a... I, I don't want my character in challenges all the time. And I want to give them something more useful across the board rather than just in that one challenge. If you have got your Lord and your plan is to run it into the enemy Lord, which is a valid tactic now that Dukes are the level of Chaos Lords almost, uh, you can just ram it down people's throats and this would be good if they accept with their Lord. However, they have control over accepting with their Lord and they're going to know that you've got this when you explain it to them, telling them your army list. The virtue of noble disdain may reroll hit rolls during the first round of combat if running into things with missile weapons. Situationally useful um, for 10 points. If you've got 10 points left over, throw it onto something and it might do something. But most of the time, my knights will likely be absolutely running over units with missile weapons because most of the time like yes a ranked up dwarf quarreler unit i might i'm saying i might not but I'd, I'd hope to so it's it's situationally worthwhile right whereas some of them like do, do, do the virtue of stoicism i'd say were really really good uh virtue of penitent really good because it's just unbreakable. Now, Virtue of Discipline may always march without having to take a leadership test within eight of the enemy. For five points, if you've got a ranging unit, I think it's really good. Um, and Virtue of Empathy, I might have said Empathy last rather than Discipline, Virtue of Empathy. Now, for five points, for your Duke, Baron, or Paladin to be able to join a unit of Peasantry, this... I would say is absolutely excellent. So, let's. No, we'll we'll carry on. We'll get into it when we get to the peasants of why I actually think these peasants are so good in the list. Now, magic items. Oh, there's such a long amount of choices. I'll have dropped in the. <laughs> I'll have dropped down below where you can skip ahead to the thoughts and the. The mounts and the damsels. Now, the, the sword of the quest for 70 points. You can choose between two profiles while using this. Either using it one-handed or two-handed. The one-handed has plus one strength, AP minus one, strike first. The two-handed plus two is basically a great weapon with multiple wounds two. Now, multiple wounds two is good. But when the ogre blade isn't strike last... And his multiple wounds D3, so averaging two. I would tend to go with the Ogre Blade, which is slightly cheaper. Because it's, although he's not got the strike first of the single-handed, the single-handed with plus one strength, minus one AP, is basically just a Morning Star. Um, and a Morning Star is 67 points cheaper. So it's, although it's got the possibility of using both, I much prefer the Ogre Blade generic, and I think that's actually, I'm using that as an example because it's a very good magic item. Um, and yet, sadly, the Sword of the Quest just doesn't do it for me. The Sword of Heroes with Monster Slayer. Now, for 60 points, you could have had the Knight to, the Virtue of Knightly Temper, and then this to gain Monster Slayer. Um, so that's where your really good Monster Killer on Hippogriff can come in. Now, Although he's very good at slaying monsters, it sort of ties into what I was saying about the virtue of heroism, where you're stuck into sort of or heading towards one role more than others. Because Monster Slayer only works against monsters. Um, you, you don't have Killing Blow and Monster Slayer. Um, 
So yeah, may, potentially it's the other way round where maybe you would take the virtue of heroism and an ogre blade rather than knightly temper and sword of heroes. But I still think I, I still think the knightly temper and an ogre blade works in all situations. Maybe not to the extent this works in its very specific one, but it's just much an, an much more all round usage. So the Heartwood lands for 50 points. You get Strength plus 3, AP minus 3 with Magical Attacks. And then in subsequent rounds you use your Hand Weapon or if you've got something else, you use something else, right? And actually... Oh, you've got to use the Hand Weapon, sorry. Now, actually I think this is really good. The plus 3 Strength, AP minus 3 is really beasty. Whether that's... 50 points is worth 50 points is hard to say when a lance is minus two anyway. Now, for 50 points, I could get an extra, say, Pegasus Knight. And although it's mi not minus three AP, it's an extra Pegasus Knight. And Pegasus Knights, although we've not been over them yet, are very good. But if you have a single model on Pegasus, say, that's hunting down things if you want to just spear it into a unit, this is a worthwhile thing to take. Morningstar of Fracassé, 40 points, plus one strength, minus one AP, and if your enemy suffers more than one wound, its magic weapon is destroyed. Yeah. So it, it, one of the most annoying magical items in the game, and it, I think it, it used to bring at least a, a little like glimmer of joy into Phil's face whenever his Bretonian bloke battered my Chaos Lord with his Morning Star of Fracasse. Now, how many magical weapons we'll keep seeing in the game? Obviously, the, the Ogre Blade, you've heard this before, <laughs> is very good. But how many we actually keep seeing will determine this item's actual use rather than me sort of speculating on it now. It will be entirely down to your meta where you're playing. On the next page, we've got the, the Gilded Cuirass, which is a suit of heavy armour as normal, as well as the Regeneration 5 up, and you'll already have a, a ward from your Blessing of the Lady. Very good. You've got the Gromril Great Helm, plus one to your armour save, and reroll natural ones when making an armour save. Well, I mean, I, I do like that it gets you Knights' armour save down, but whether it's worth it for 40 points when something like a Gilded Cuirass is um, 60 points, I would much prefer the Gilded Cuirass to have a 3-up, 5-up, 5-up versus... And I'm going to refer to the, the Blessing of the Lady as the 5-up because that's when it most matters. A 3-up, 5-up, 5-up, I would say, is much better for 60 points than a 2-up, 5-up, re-rolling the 1s on the 2-up. You've got the Mantle of Damsel Elens. You're immune to poison attacks. Now, I've not played too many ghouls or lizardmen players yet, but it, it seems too situational for me, my own personal taste to be taking a magic item like this. Sereni's Locket, um, models with infantry or cavalry, multiple wounds, you're immune to multiple wounds. 25 points and this is where I suppose if you're taking this um, the ogre blades against you become much less good but I've not found the need to take this yet there might be a point where I get really ragey <laughs> about about just like oh my god I'm just taking so many multiple wounds but it's not this day you've got the Valoria standard 3d6 when making a break test and discarding the highest now this is really good and say having this on a battle standard bearer that's got the virtue of empathy so is even if it's leadership eight making a leadership eight test with 3d6 discarding the highest might keep a big block bit around um although you don't want to be losing combats that much with your knights it so it becomes less valuable foot knights i think this is really valuable for um because three, d especially on a battle standard bearer, right? Three d six, discarding the highest and then re rolling, the chances become very slim that you're going to fail that, and that this is going to be a toss up between this banner and the one included in the arcane journal, which we'll go over in a second. 
over what situation you want to do what in. Conqueror's Tapestry, enemy banners are worth 100 points as trophies of war. <laughs> I, I always put this in my list and I always drop it out when I start squeezing points, which is most times. And that's because it's sort of, you're gambling, right? You, you're gambling and a lot of Bretonian units don't have 50 points caps on their units banners. If they did, I'd take this every time, but when it's on a, a battle standard bearer, it's harder to justify. And then Grail Knights, I always look at them and go, yeah, I'm going to beat units, but does it want to be 40 points more expensive? Errantry Banner plus one strength on a turn that you charge, but you gain Impetuous. Now that's very useful. Um, a lot of the times you do just want to be charging with your knights. I always avoid it just because I don't want to lose control of my unit in case I want to hang back. But actually, I think it's a really good one. The, one of the weaknesses of most knights is that they're strength three in the Bretonian list. Um, and having that strength four going to strength six with a lance is, in, is incredibly useful. And I think it's just actually I've been playing too conservative and I should be taking something like this much more often. The baller... The Banner of Chalons, you cannot be standing shot at when using this banner. Now, and, and, I, and I'm going to keep saying this, like, I think this is quite a good banner. If you were charging into enemy with shooting weapons, now that that adds to combat res, this takes that away, so you're more likely to break them on the charge, or at least get them to fall back in good order because of having... A higher modifier to their modified leadership so they're more likely to fall back in good order i am actually more towards the boys over toys approach to games so i tend to go less into magic items um, and more unless they're very useful to my specific list um, and rely on just having more models but if you're looking for a good one and you're playing like dwarves High Elves, Empire a lot. This is a very good item to take. We've got Enchanted Items, the Falcon Horn of Freedomund for 40 points. So during the command phase of your turn, if you're not engaged in combat, you can blow the horn by making a leadership test. If passed, only you can fly in the next turn. Your opponent cannot fly. So all of these gyrocopter lists that we've been hearing about at the start of the Old World, as soon as they encounter a Bretonian player, cannot do that. Now, this is something that I would recommend taking for everyone. So I'd recommend taking this on your Battle Standard Bearer, and that's because I don't want to put my Battle Standard Bearer in harm's way too often. A lot of the time, my Battle Standard Bearer rocks about with my Baron or Duke and just sticks around there and just carries the banner. So I don't need any extra survivability items on there other than the heavy armor, shield, um, and potentially barded warhorse that they've already got. Yes, it makes me less likely to pass that leadership test by one, but it is very, like it's a very useful magic item and not taking away from my Duke or Baron's magic items limits. And going more on something that I'm not expecting a combat monster out of. And that can be combined with the battle stand, having a different battle standard bearer because it's a different allowance. The Antlers of the Great Hunt, uh, when mounted on a, on a war horse, gains move through cover to them and their unit. This is incredibly useful for just steaming through covers and it, it doesn't ignore the minuses to moving through terrain on a charge, as far as I can see. So you're still rolling 2d6, picking the lowest and adding your swift stride. Um, so watch out for that one, but it does allow you to just power through terrain. Gauntlet of the Jewel, very good, very good for five points. Um, when you've got a knight and you charge into a unit of infantry, the unit of infantry are usually getting charged and therefore you're going first and you're getting your lance. And for five points to just nuke your opponent's champion or have the chance to, I think it's very good. now. In this section, actually, I would just as a quick shout out to the outcast list. This is very good if you're playing outcasts because it means that you can get your blessing of the lady more easily 
because the enemy will have to accept your challenge. You kill them, you get Blessing of the Lady. Falcon Horn of Freedman, very good because you've got Veteran on your actual character. So your character can re-roll the leadership test for blowing the Falcon Horn of Freedman. Um, so he's, he's very good in that list. But we'll get more onto that in the, the addendum. The additional items found in the Arcane Journal that apply to the main Bretonian list as well. We have the Anointed Armour, so models with the Grail Vow who are infantry or cavalry. Um, it's a suit of heavy armour and you're immune to the killing blow and multiple wounds, special rules. Instead you suffer a single wound. Um, if you ever lose the, the, the Blessing of the Lady, it's lost. It, it's good, I don't think it's a Gilded Cuerras though. Uh, Iron Spike Shield, 20 points. Oh no, ignore me. That's an Exiles one. You've got Grail Pendant, single use only. When you lose your last wound on a two up, it's not lost for 40 points. I think it's quite expensive. Gilded Cuirass, uh, if I'm really scared about stuff like that. Uh, it, it's a good item, but because it's only an extra wound, I am not personally, I'm not into that sort of stuff. Now onto the magic standards, this is where it becomes a bit more interesting. We've got the Banner of Ladies Grace for 75 points. You ignore all negative modifiers to leadership characteristic. And this is where sort of the, the discussion, I think, comes in. Um, so you've got two options, basically, for your standard. You've got one which is roll 3d6 and pick the lowest. Now that will make you more likely to fall back in good order. Otherwise, you've got the Banner of the Lady's Grace, which will, no negative modifies to your leadership, you've got to only ever give ground because you always pass your unmodified leadership if you pass that. So that then comes down to the choice of, do you want to fall back in good order and your enemy counts as charging more? Now, that would then be more useful on a unit that you might want to reform the um, the front rank of um because you run away and then you can add you guys to the back if you're falling back in good order and and also like sort of change the facing of that unit to orientate off slightly so it gives you a bit more flexibility in the the shape of your unit turn by turn now the banner of ladies grace giving ground all the time i have really liked this personally playing it on a big unit of foot knights now foot knights with the great axes like i'll take a a charge one turn yes some of them will die but then it gives me a chance to be smashing people back with their great axes uh, then at strength five ap minus two whereas without that foot knights being strength three without the the axes or, or without the great weapons being strength three with no AP, I've not found the most useful. And also, it allow, it just allows your big units to start wearing down the enemy. And I'm, especially with a unit of foot knights, where I'm going to be quite a wide frontage anyway, because I've not got hard. It's, it, I don't care about reforming that unit. So it's, I, my personal choice is this Banner of Ladies Grace. But the 3D6 pick the two lowest. I do think there is something to be said for if you can say put it on a battle standard bearer in a big peasant block that you might want to then reform to add models to the back when you're getting pushed back. And I don't really care about my enemy getting the charge because it's more of an anvil unit rather than like sort of a, an anvil hammer unit. And it's just worth saying, um, while we're on the banners, like I know I've said about a battle standard get bearer going into a unit of peasants. Now, if you've got the virtue of empathy, obviously I can join a unit of peasants. Now, the levy special rule says that models with the levy special rule can't use a battle standard bearer or general's leadership. So I can use my battle standard bearer's leadership and I'm not my models with the levy special rule aren't using the battle standard bearers reroll my guy with the battle standard will be now that is a very powerful combination i think for having an anchor um and whether that was the intention 
I, I don't know with the rules. I'm just sort of like presenting this. Um, so I don't know the intention of the game designer's rules. So, but as it is written, you can put your battle standard bear in there with the virtue of empathy and then he himself use a re-roll and use the, and you can definitely use the battle standards effects in that unit of peasants. So I suppose if you took the the banner from the Arcane Journal, you could be testing on an unmodified leadership of 10 because your peasants have hard and the Warband special rule. So it's a, it's a very powerful anchor for that battle line, which is why I've mentioned the battle standard bearer a few times with peasants. So into the character's mounts. <laughs> We've been talking about this a long time, I suppose. So I hope everyone's still enjoying like the more long format cast. Let me know if you are or whether you'd prefer a more shortened down truncated version where I only go over the highlights of magic items and stuff in the future. So we've got the Bretonian Warhorse, pretty standard. It comes with counter charge, so you won't be stopping your knights counter charging when you add a Bretonian character to a unit of knights. Uh, you've got a Warhorse. Now, this will allow you to join a unit of skirmishing men at arms so your damsel i suppose when we get there can do that you can't take it for a duke baron or paladin as sort of is right but it doesn't include counter charge so if you want a damsel to join a unit of knights she needs to go on a bretonian war horse otherwise the knights will lose counter charge and, it, and there's no real big talking points in those um, in those mounts because it's they're just the standard ones that most of the time you'll be on one or the other and it depends whether or not you want to go into a big block of knights or a block of men at arms on foot on horseback and you can only join the men at arms on horseback if you've got your virtue of empathy if you're a knight character so you've got bardy pegasus weapon skill three strength four plus one wound so you Paladins go into three wounds, your Duke and Baron are going to four. Your Baron might your Baron's going to five. And you've got initiative four, two attacks. Now very useful for getting that fly ten. He's got first charge, counter charge, swift stride. He's just an absolutely excellent mount for hunting down war machines. A single paladin on their own with a, a mid-level virtue will be very effective at taking out a unit of fast cav or skirmishers on a pegasus and if if you play another bretonian and they brrr, blow the falcon horn of freedman you still have basically a, a horse that's movement seven so he's an he's excellent really the royal pegasus for an extra 30 points you get an extra weapon skill an extra movement all the time when on on foot on on hot on horse when you're galloping, you get strength 5, plus 1 toughness, plus 1 wound as well, initiative 5, and 3 attacks. E even better for hunting down war machines and stuff like that on their own. Both of these options are good for a unit of Pegasus Knights. Going at the front of your lance, your 50 by 50 won't disrupt that lance formation, so you just stick it at the front. Um... And it's basically, have you got that 30 points to spare? If you do, this is obviously a better option. I don't think it's needed for a Paladin hunting down a unit of Fast Cav. So you might want to skimp on the points and go just normal Bardic Pegasus. But the Royal Pegasus will just ensure it with the extra strength, extra attack. And your toughness is going to be higher. Um, finally, the Unicorn. Oh, we've got, not finally, the Hippogriff. The Unicorn at movement 10. Uh, plus one wound for your damsel or prophetess that's on it. And beguiling Aurora, enemy models must take a leadership test before making to hit rolls during the combat phase. If failed, only natural sixes um, will hit. And that's against this model specifically. It means that you can rock about with your prophetess going 10 inches on a single move or 20 on a march. And have a bit more staying power with the plus one wound and a bit of a nice thing with the beguiling aurora aura. I wouldn't counter it massively 
doing really well in combat. Like, yes, you'll have three attacks with a damsel or four with a prophetess, but in total, including the mount, but I wouldn't ever expect anything from that. What it is really good for is being movement 10 and just allowing you to go at a marching level for everyone else or our foot troops and still casting magic missiles so you can get elsewhere. And although you could take a Pegasus to do this with the Prophetess, you're stuck with a damsel. You're stuck with a with simply a unicorn. Um, and both of them very useful for getting that movement level of 10. It's just the, the Royal Pegasus will be adding the toughness as well as the wound and will be able to fly over other units. But it's not too much of a downside running about 20, getting your dispel ranges where you want. That'll usually be towards the front, but behind your lines. Um, I think he's really useful. So it's a useful 35 point upgrade for that damsel. So the Hippogriff is not something I've used personally. However, Phil has used it to devastating effect against me. Um, at weapon skill five, strength five, plus one toughness, plus three wounds, initiative five and four attacks. It's not quite a dragon. It obviously doesn't have the breath weapon as well. However, having counter charge is a really, really useful special rule. Um, it means that it just can't get caught out as easily. Um, and it's still got the terror. It's got swift stride. Still got the close order. You can have barding on it to add to your heavy armor and shield. So you can get in a two up save quite easily for 135 points um, and it's nothing to sniff at although it's not as good as the best dragons having your your blessing little lady built in to your bretonian characters so that it's got the ward without having to like upgrade extra points and take up out your magic items limit i think is actually a lot to be said for it hippogriff with gilded cuirass um with virtue of knightly temper is getting an insane number of attacks Although it's not as good as a Chaos Lord on Gra Dragon, because that was the comparison I used to a Duke, it's still an in it's still an incredibly scary monster. That as like Phil has taken out vampires with it, um, like up fully upgraded vampires with this, like full units of Blood Knights with a vampire in uh, by charging them in the rear, getting that plus two combat res. Um, and it's, it's just incredibly good for that fly movement, supporting your knights, going a bit faster than your knights. So being able to jump over units and get a rear charge on the hardest enemy units. And it's a solid enough block with actually quite a small base size that you can fit behind your enemy uh, just that bit easier than a full unit of Pegasus knights to break the ranks and just make your knights coming in from the front's job a little bit easier in that tough nuts to crack area. So onto the handmaidens of the lady. We finally move off dukes, paladins and barons. We've got basically three win versus two win profile with leaderships eight and seven for the prophetess versus damsel. You've got access to battle magic, elementalism and illusion um, and cost 35 or 65 points. I would definitely recommend the upgrade to the level four or two depending on which one you prefer. Now, the bonus of just having cheap damsels, I think, is being able to grant knights of the realm and things like that uh, magical attacks. And that could even be done to realms on foot or even peasants because you don't have a knightly vow. So you can be stacking up a lot of magical attacks and not scared of vampires, basically, or anything where a magical attack is going to ignore a ward, say, um, it's just useful to be able to get that in the place that you want and it's only 60 points. The Shield of the Lady, um, if you've joined a unit strength of 10 or more and has a Chivalrous Vow, you may retire to the rear of the unit and still cast spells from there. Really useful to just go in the centre of say six knights, you fill the space, or five knights, you fill the gap in the middle of the centre um, and none of your knights aren't striking then. It is very, very useful. But the main point on Handmaidens of the Lady, I think, is really going to come down to, do you take a level four or a two? 
and that at this point I think is personal preference. I end up thinking that now a lot of spells are a 9 plus to cast. If I'm level 2, I'm going to be failing half the time with my level 2 wizard. Whereas a level 4 just sort of ensures that I'm getting those spells off. And having more use even though it's double the points of the prophetess. Um, magic items wise, I suppose if you're taking a prophetess... You can have the Falconhorn of Freeman here as well as you can have, like, as to as good a place as you can have it on a Paladin Battle Standard Bearer, as I mentioned before, So because they're both Leadership 8. You've got Magic Resistance 2, which is useful, or the Lady, yeah. Um, and what laws does it come down to? So you've got Battle Magic, Elementalism, and Illusion. I like Elementalism uh, because... Basically, over battle magic, when my damsel in is, is in a unit of knights, they've likely got um, a, a, a ward save anyway, so I don't need to cast Oaken Shield on them. Of the other spells within battle magic, you've got very similar ones that you can cast from Illusion, and I'd say Oaken Shield is like the, the best one for me in battle magic, whereas in Elementalism, you have... Plague of Rust with a, a 21 inch range, minus two to an enemy's armor saves. Now that will help better than arrow attraction, I would say, versus most enemy units, because just denying them a save or minusing two to their save that goes off on a spell I really like. You've got Earthen Ramparts that rather than Oaken Shield being cast on the damsel's own unit, you can cast it on a unit in 15, so I can be in a unit of knights giving them magical attacks. And, or even just riding around and then from 15 inches away give a unit defended ramparts and a 5 up ward. I think it's just much more usable in many situations. And although that unit can't charge, it's quite nice to be able to give a unit a buff for the next turn um, that then like keeps them safe and I can rely on that having been done in my command phase, knowing what I'm going to set up in the future. Travel Mystical Pathway. Um, if a unit isn't fleeing and has not already moved during this turn, I can remove it from the battlefield and replace it anywhere within 12 of its original location, not within 6 inches of any model. So that actually works quite well with Earth and Ramparts um, because then I won't be charging or marching, but I can still maintain mobility so long as that unit didn't really want to charge. So yeah, I, I quite like Elementalism. Now, one thing to really look out for is actually the lore of the Lady is, I would say, very, very good. So you can... <laughs> I would skip Elementalism's um, signature spell and go for one of these in instead. And I think two really stand out to me. So you get the Lady's Gift... Basically, it's a 7 10 to cast within 12, and that unit gets a regen 6 or 5, depending on the casting level. Really, really good. Putting that on a big block that you want to hold. Like, I mentioned my unit of Knights of the Realm with great weapons. Having the Blessing of the Lady, the Lady's Gift, and their armor saves on that unit is really, really good. Um, and just having it on any unit, getting a 6-up or 5-up additional save is nothing to be sniffed at. Especially when it's on a casting value as, as low as 7 or even 10 for the 5-up. With a Prophetess level 4, you only need to roll a 6 on 2 dice. And it's going off more than average being on a 6. Burning Gaze is also excellent. Casting value on a 10+, plus, so it's a lot harder to get off. However, basically, it's like a beam. You roll 5d6, and anything touched in that straight line, which is like literally a laser pointer straight line, um, enemy model, any enemy model that falls under the line suffers a single strength 4 with no armor saves. Um, so it's just great for just cutting through enemy units. And this is where having a fast unicorn or barded pegasus, or royal pegasus, really comes into its own. Because being able to move that 10 and then do a magic missile 
is incredibly good mobility wise because you'll be able to like basically just cannon down the sides of people's units uh, except slightly better because you're not capped at the amount of hits that their like front facing or flanks are made up of it's just literally every you every model the lady's wrath finally you've got a casting value of nine remains in play um, you gain a plus one to strength and plus one to armor piercing. It's also really, really solid. Um, Cast on the caster, their mount, and any unit they've joined. However, despite the fact that he's very good, I sort of think it pales in insignificance. Or not pales in insignificance. I just think the lady's gift and burning gaze are just so good. Um, swapping out for the lady's wrath. I haven't done it yet, um, is what I'll say, because the, the burning gaze is just so... You could just roll 5d6 and bam, I've just got 36 inches range and just blaze down the side of my opponent's ranks. And I know that do, won't actually happen like that, getting 5 sixes, but yeah, it's the, the opportunity cost there is just so good. So this, then we've got finally in this section, the silver mirror is single use only, when attempting make to make a wizardly dispel, may roll an extra d6 uh, and discard the lowest. If a double one is rolled, the bear is uh, outclassed and fails. And if the dispel attempts is successful, the casting wizard suffers a strength four AP minus two. I think it's very expensive for a ma for a single use. I don't think it could like it could be balanced to be used every turn, you, like rolling three d6 and discarding the lowest. But for single use for thirty five points. I think it's too expensive personally. We've got the Sacrament of the Lady. Single use. May use it before making a casting roll. Plus two to that casting roll. Again expensive. It's as expensive as a, a wizard level all the time. So if you're doing something like this. And you've got a level two wizard. Try and get a Prophetess if you've not got a Baron. Because it's not too much more expensive. The Prayer Icon of Quinelles. 25 points, increase your dispel range by three. Now this is actually really good because if you get a prophetess with this, she can just sit around dispelling things all the time. So next on to the Sergeant Arms, and this is the final character we'll be going over in the Bretonian rundown. So you've got a movement of four, weapon skill four, BS two, strength four, because you're a bully boy, toughness three, two wounds, Initiative 4, 2 attacks, leadership 7 for 45 points. Now, it's not the greatest of stat lines, but just ignore it. I wouldn't care at all. Um, you can take a halberd, additional hand weapon, cavalry spear. Um, yep. Yep. And like, it's weird that you can't take a polearm that you'll see when we get to the Bretonian men-at-arms bit. It's a bit strange, but who cares? I would definitely take a shield because you want this person to be sticking around. Mounted on a war horse. Now, I mean, the Sergeant Arms could be adding an extra like champion's profile to Yeoman, your mounted Yeoman, but I'd probably just take some more mounted Yeoman rather than a Sergeant at Arms to do that. Um, yeah, magic items. I would not be putting any magic items on this character. So special rules, you've got levies. Uh, peasant's duty, peasantry and warband. Now warband is important in here because it means that you can use this character's leadership when making a warband modified leadership test. So if you've got three ranks in that warband unit with this character in who has warband, your leadership will now be 10, which is incredibly good, um, obviously. You've then got the peasant's duty the character in any unit that they've joined may choose to give ground rather than fall back in good order and doesn't have to take a panic chest when a friendly unit of levies breaks and flees from combat within six inches of them. Unless this character is fleeing and within command range, anyone with the la levy special rule may re-roll all failed panic checks. Um, this special rule just does so much. So... Basically, you're, on, you're going to be on leadership 10 because you're going to have three ranks, let's say. Uh, I know that can get whittled down eventually, but at that point, what you'll do is choose to fall back in good order and add extra ranks to your unit. Um, 
in doing that, you can give, in falling back in good order, you can instead give ground if you don't need to add ranks, and you just give ground, and I don't care about losing so long as I'm passing my leadership 10 test. Um, it's, it's incredibly good for getting your peasants to hold the line. Um, yes, you might just spike and fail that leadership 10 test, but it's not going to be it's not going to be that often that they actually run away because you're basically testing on an unmodified leadership 10 with this sergeant at arms. Basically, all you have to do is remember to never accept a challenge with your sergeant at arms. Um, yeah, yeah, they are incredibly good characters. Um, and, it, and it's quite simple in their operation. Like once you've played a few games of the old world, you'll see how your anchor unit will be so benefited by just if they'd have just given ground and that is what this character is doing to those men at arms so on to the general infantry your core choices um really we've got the knights of the realm on foot um and we'll be comparing that to the men at arms foot wise knights of the realm on foot you're going to one plus um for the knights of the realm this could satisfy it You've got a movement of four, weapon skill four, strength, toughness three, one wound, initiative three, one attack, leadership eight, 11 points. So you're on a 25 by 25. Um, and you've got Blessings of the Lady, Close Order, Furious Charge, and the Knight's Vow. So that means if you're charging, you're going to two attacks on the charge or three for your first knight. I'm definitely going to say you're wanting to be taking the full command with these. Uh, I personally really like great weapons with them because for plus one point, I'm only losing out. I'm going from a four up to a five up in, instead of using my shield. I'm still getting my shield if I take one for two points. So then I've got the option. And being only strength three with no AP with my hand weapons, I sort of feel like this unit needs a little boost to be able to actually do something. Now how I've been running this unit is with my battle standard bearer in there, with the banner of the lady's grace, so I'll only ever give ground, which means my opponent that might be using lances or great weapons of their own when they charge, aren't going to be getting that charge again. And if they don't follow up when I've given ground, I'm gonna be getting the charge. Um, and it just gives them that bit more staying power, I would say despite the fact that you're losing an armor save. Now, in terms of unit shape, I have been liking eight wide or nine wide, and I'd be doing that in three ranks deep. And I know people have been saying about line hammer recently. It's just popped up on the internet <laughs> in the last couple of days. Um, it's just historical battle-looking lines, right? Um, not. I'm not suggesting anyone go sort of like single line 10 wide, but a three rank deep, because that means I've got the staying power, I've got a bit of static combat res that I do think infantry benefits from quite a lot. Um, and I can basically start grinding down my opponent that in the second turn, I can start getting my great weapons in. I suppose this is where the, the lady's wrath could come in by having a ranked up unit that the lady's in the back of, off the top of my head. I can't remember now whether it goes off in the lands formation only. Uh, but having the Lady's Wrath getting me to strength 4, and then with a great weapon being strength 6, you can really start successfully hacking down other people. The Lady's Blessing, I would say, is really valuable for that, because it gains you that when you know you're striking second, it gaining that ward, especially against things that are going to be ignoring your armour, like a a flail or a great weapon or a lance that's minus two, so ignoring your heavy armor, having that lady's blessing is invaluable. Um, and that this is a unit that I think needs a bit more from a character, like, like a battle standard bearer that you need, like stopping about, meaning that they're definitely sticking around so that they can start grinding down your opponent. Um, I think that's necessary. Um, Comparing them to men at arms, you've got men at arms at four points a model rather than the what was it, 12 points a model 
for 11 points of model for the Knights of the Realm on foot. You've got Weapon Skill 2, Strength, Toughness 3, 1 Wound, 1 Attack, Leadership 5, but you've got Horde and Warband, so that you actually Leadership 8 when you've got 3 ranks and 4 points. He's just e excellent. Like, I really don't care that I'm Weapon Skill 2. I'm happy for Weapon Skill 5s to hit me on 2s, because I'm, I've actually been running these in blocks of 40 and 50. And that's not multiple blocks of 40 and 50, it's at least it's one block of 40 or 50. And then my, I've actually been running them with Knights of the Realm on foot, off to the side, sort of like being either a flanker or a hammer unit to the anvil that is the men at arms. Now what really helps them be an anvil unit is not only do they have um, like a really cheap cost, they've got shield wall, which the first time they get falling back in good order, they can just choose to go give ground. And also, they've got the option of having a Grail Monk with Blessed trip, trip tech, trip tick, um, which basically means that you get stubborn. So the first time you need to take a leadership check, you just give, you just fall back in good order, and then I can change that to give ground with my shield wall. Now, I've still been adding a Sergeant at Arms into that, so that in further rounds of combat, I can still just give ground. So it's just this really grinding unit. But I've been finding that really successful and forcing my opponents, although it's not that manoeuvrable because it's 10 wide or 13 wide and 4 deep. Although it's not that manoeuvrable, just forcing your opponent to deal with this massive block that so long as I protected the flanks with my own knights it's really hard to get rid of. Um, yeah, and it's, I, I found them really successful. So I actually like the men, at, the men at arms are a bit more of a mainstay for me in the list because you've got to have one unit of either bowmen or men at arms. And I found this, this unit really useful. Now, so saying that I really like this unit doesn't mean that the Knights of the Realm on foot don't have a place. I've actually really enjoyed using them and found them to be really successful when I've got a battle standard bearer or even a battle standard bearer and a character in there. Um, they're just actually a really solid unit because they've all got that blade, ladies ward um, and they're just pretty grinding to get rid of. Uh, and they, they serve a different purpose being the, the hammer rather than the anvil that the men at arms provide. It's just that, say, when I'm taking the Knights of the Realm on foot, that reduces the amount of hammer I've got in the form of knights on horseback because they're competing for that higher points range slot. Next, we'll go on to Squires. Now, Squires at seven points a model aren't too much more expensive than a Bowman, which I believe is five off the top of my head. I'd like, I mean, he's it's been a, looking at a few unit entries now. So yeah, I believe it's five points a model for a normal Bowman. The main benefit of these is when, or I think, when you start looking into the special rules, which is the Vanguard movement, they, they've got move through cover, so they're not caring about that minus one movement for moving through cover. Um, and you can also upgrade them with Fire and Flee and the Scout special rule. Now, there's a little, there is a benefit of using these for just sort of being around terrain, making sure enemy wizards can't come into that terrain because you'll just mob them with, I don't know, six or eight squires. And there is definitely a usefulness to that. The secondary usefulness of squires over um, peasant bowmen is that they're not taking up space in my deployment zone because I have been finding that my deployment zone is with my peasants that I've got to take um, with a trebuchet or trebuchet or bombard in an outcast list and then a couple of lances of knights. I've been finding my deployment really cramped and not, when I've taken skirmishing units of peasant bowmen, there's been no good place to put them. Now, the reason I'm still sort of wanting these in my list is as I say, hunting down wizards that might pop into terrain and then just standing there with longbows and taking pot shots at like any toughness three target that's on the table. Like I'm not expecting tons and tons from this unit, but for 49 points for a min unit and for eight of them, which I 
feel like I could reliably take down a wizard with, or like a, not a, maybe not a chaos sorcerer, but say like a damsel level wizard, I could mob one of them with sort of like six to eight of them, and I feel it's a worthwhile investment and it speed bumps people coming through the flank. You can even use their mobility as skirmishers to be able to sort of like screen other units, bait charges. Um, so it is definitely worthwhile having these cheaper, less immediately worthwhile looking units that you can alter and play with your opponent's movement with. Now on the flip side of that, Peasant Bowman. For five points a model, you're getting the same ballistic skill, like the same leadership. He's basically the same of everything um, the, the, that you'll be looking at in Squires, except you've not got the Fire and Flea, and Fire and Flea is definitely useful because it's preserving the Squires. Um, you can take the Skirmishers special rule, which is something that I've been sort of leaning towards because it's a free upgrade for the unit rather than... Um, rather than just being in a close order, I'm not expecting my bowmen to ever survive if they get into combat. It's sort of a throwaway. So I'd much prefer the mobility of being skirmishers and then just choosing not to use it when I'm deploying if it's not worthwhile being in skirmishers. Now, I've not played any Tomb Kings yet, so I've not been looking at the Burning Braziers or, or things like that. Vampire Counts, I've, I've played once. Um, against an opponent with vampire counts. So for 20 points a unit, it's not yet looked worthwhile to me to upgrade with them. However, if you're playing a lot of those units, you could start upgrading with burning braziers. Defensive stakes, disrupting an enemy charge, I'm not a massive fan of for 10 points because, as I said, if the enemy is going to make contact with me, they're they're going to kill me anyway. And dangerous terrain tests, although it's only 10 points to do, I suppose a unit is likely going to fail one dangerous terrain test. Putting my points there rather than just trying to ensure it doesn't happen. Um, I've always found more worthwhile with the skirmishers special rule, even if I don't end up using skirmishers. Would I take light armour? No. So I, I suppose essentially the choice is do you have any points left over in special? If so, I would go with Squires. Um, one thing to say, actually, is if you've got a big unit of Peasant Bowmen, having a Damsel in there, if you're playing against Vampire Counts, I can see as being worthwhile because it adds magical attacks to their attacks. Um, and then that Damsel can leave, if you say they're on a Steed, can leave and join a different unit when you get to combat time. And it's quite a nice way to bounce about from these peasant bowmen with those magical attacks into a different unit. So next we go on to the Battle Pilgrims and Grail Relique. Um, <laughs> what to say about these? You've got a 5 to 30 in the unit and may include a Grail Relique for 65 points. I mean, regardless of the rules that we're going to go through, a Grail Relique as an upgrade to the Battle Pilgrims, you've got to have at least one, right? I mean, surely... So, Battle Pilgrims have close order and hatred all enemies. That sort of makes up for their weapon skill too. They're only strength, toughness 3, 1 wound, uh, initiative 3, 1 attack, leadership 8, and they're 8 points each, so double the cost of a men at arms. They've got hand weapon, shield, and light armor. Um, the Grail Relique has blessings of the lady, close order, hatred all enemies, uh, levies, peasantry, retinue of the saints and stubborn. So Retinue of the Saints, um, your army may include up to one Grail Relique for every character or unit with the Grail, grail Vow it includes. So that's your, your Duke will unlock one Grail Relique. So at very base value, if you're taking a, a Duke and no Grail Knights as a unit, you can take a Grail Relique. And what that Grail Relique does... Relique? What the Grail Relique does is mean that your unit, if you're within 12 inches of that model with the Grail Vow, you gain unbreakable and immune to psychology. Now, do I think this unit is worthwhile compared to a men-at-arms unit? I, I don't. 
as soon as you've got 10 um, battle pilgrims, well, I suppose the Grail Relic is more points than a Sergeant at Arms. And although it's giving you Unbreakable, your men at arms will end up at half the price of the Battle Pilgrims and don't top out at 30. So although you get hatred on the Battle Pilgrims, they're still only strength three with no no benefits of AP or anything like that. So you can't really expect anything of them at all. All you can expect for them to be is unbreakable and men at arms actually do that really well. Although there is them a chance of breaking, falling back in good order on a leadership 10 fail and then that getting automatically converted to a give ground is, is an incredible, incredible unit. And although these are unbreakable, I just don't think it's worth that double the points for this unit to be unbreakable and with hatred. Because I'm just not expecting either of... If, even with hatred, I'm not expecting this unit to kill anything to make up its points to be worthwhile. So on to the different knights. So we have Knights Errant and Knights of the Realm. Now, a Knights Errant is 19 points... Knights of the Realm is 24 points. These are more comparable because they like with lances, right? Um, it's obviously worth taking, I would say, the full command on all of these because you're already in your peasants, not like giving away any points for standard bearers. Uh, so you don't need to worry about it that much because you can't actually give away that many points if you've got a load of peasants. Now, the main difference is other than, like, you've got a human profile, strength, toughness, three, one wound, initiative, three. Uh, and then the main difference between the Knights of the Realm and the Knights Errant is a leadership of seven versus eight on the Errant and three versus four weapon skill uh, on the Errant versus Realm, the Realm being better. So what it comes down to with the Knights of the Realm, saying that the profiles are the same, is actually the special rules that they've got. So, Knights Errant lack counter charge but have Impetuous. Um, so, a big units of Knights Errant might be good for going into infantry that they definitely aren't going to get charged by. Knights of the Realm, when you're staying at your long distance charge range and your opponent can just about make it as well, if the enemy get in, you get to counter charge them. And that, and that is... A good difference for Knights of the Realm. Now, if you can be more selective with your charges, I think you then start boiling down to the weapon skill 3 versus weapon skill 4 difference because actually the leadership, I'm counting on winning my charges anyway because if I'm not, something's gone horribly wrong with my battle plan. So the weapon skill 3 versus 4. And it might have the, a different effect than you'd be expecting. So a weapon skill 3 on the Knights Errant means that I'm hitting weapon skill 4s, 5s, and 6s on 4s. Now, the weapon skill 4 on the Knights of the Realm means I'm hitting weapon skill 4, 5s, and 6s on 4s, which is the same as the Knights Errant. What the Knights of the Realm is better at is hitting weapon skill 3 opponents. So, you've actually got this difference in profile that's displaying itself by you crushing lesser enemies with the knights of the realm and being just as good as the knights errant so i suppose overall better because you've got counter charge but being just as good at the knights errant with your harder opponents so what you want to be doing i would say is putting your knights errant into anything with weapon skill four um and your knights of the realm into anything weapon skill three and if something needs both units to crack it's needed both units to crack anyway but that would be the, the calculation I'm doing in my head when selecting how to use these units. On to questing knights. Um, 26 points model, so what is that? Three points, two points more than a normal knight of the realm. You've got weapon skill five, so an extra one on knights of the realm. And that means you're obviously hitting weapon skill four opponents now on threes. You've got Strength 4, which is a big boost over the Knights of the Realm. Uh, toughness 3, 1 wound, Initiative 4, though that doesn't really matter. 1 attack, Leadership 8, 
you've got great weapons, so you're plus two strength, and that tips you into the strength six range, which is really good because you're then wounding toughness four opponents on twos rather than threes. You've got obviously heavy armor, shields, hand weapons, so you could just use your hand weapons versus anyone else, but I think you want to be selective in your opponents and get a long charge against an initiative four opponent at best, really, or go into the flanks of an initiative four opponent to strike first with your great weapons. Um, and I think basically that's it. It's, it's for hunting harder opponents um, if you don't want to splash out on the points of a Grail Knight. One thing that we actually... like This is the point that I'd actually compare these to the Pegasus Knights. Now, because the benefit of the questing knights is that they've got strength four, for 55 points, so yes, I know it's double the cost of a, a knight of a questing knight, you could actually have a, a albeit weapon skill four, but strength four, two wounds rather than one, uh not Pegasus Knight. And because the Pegasus Knights have movement or fly ten and also Furious Charge, so you're going to two attacks on the charge. They can be Swift, swift, stride, uh, swift Striders, <laughs> Skirmishers, as well as being in Lance Formation, just as you need them, so they can break ranks if you want. Uh, they can basically do everything that that Questing Knight can do, except for the Weapon Skill 5, um, just as well, I would say, and also have the benefit of having two wounds and... Like, even though they, they double the cost, they've got double the wounds and on the charge got two attacks. And with Fly 10 and Swift Stride, you're pretty much going to be getting the charge. They're just so manoeuvrable, can fly over terrain. So I think they actually step on the feet of the Questing Knights a bit. Like, the only benefit of Questing Knights over Pegasus Knights, other than the Weapon Skill 5, is the fact that they'll get those... Uh, great weapons in the second round of combat. So if you come up against, say, another Bretonian army where you know they're going to just give ground against you rather than fall back in good order, the Questing Knights might be more attractive. But if they're going to fall back in good order, you're going to get your charge again to get Furious Charge with those Pegasus Knights. Um, so, it's, yeah, it sort of steps on the toes of the Questing Knights. Now, Pegasus Knights as a unit... I definitely run them with full command. Magic standard at 50 points. Don't think you need to get like plus one strength and impetuous. I'd actually keep these maybe even with a war banner for just plus one um plus one combat res. So that you just stack in combat res and definitely like although you'd be definitely winning, you want to make sure you get the fall back in good order by making them fail their modified leadership test. And just getting on a roll with these. Now, once you've won a combat, don't forget, or you've swept an opponent, don't forget you can reform and then go into either a skirmish formation or into a lance. So if you started off in a lance formation, which like you can break ranks with is great. If at that point it's worthwhile, you can then switch to skirmish formation and go war machine hunting. It's a, a really versatile, worthwhile unit. I think this is the number one killer of the Bretonian list at the moment. The final type of knight that we'll go over is the Grail Knights. And these for 38 points each. Although not as expensive as a Pegasus Knight, are getting up there in price. They are weapon skill 6, however. So they're, they're one more than Chaos Knights, I believe. They're strength toughness 4, initiative 5, 2 attacks and leadership nine um and what to say about these they've got blessings of the lady all the time because they've got the grail vow they've got living saints so they can all issue and accept challenges so you can just bog down enemy characters in challenges just one by one with your grail knights they've got close order counter charge finest war horses first charge like all other bretonian knights essentially uh swift stride grail vow uh, they, they're just that one-up mega hard unit of knights. And I think it's basically a similar usage to every other unit of knights, except you use them as you see fit. I can't see... 
I wouldn't use them as a min unit of three because then you're only getting six attacks, although it could work. Um, but taking one wound massively reduces that unit. I'd probably see myself taking them in unit of sixes mostly um, and just relying on that lance formation to get the maximum number of attacks because you're getting 11 attacks then from your Grail Knights on the charge in the lance um, and just absolutely skewering people at strength six. The last unit of cavalry we'll go on to is the Mounted Yeoman. Now these are a weapon skill three strength, they're a basic human profile, right? With leadership six, 13 points a model um, and with light cavalry and skirmishers, as well as fast cavalry, they're a really versatile, different unit of cavalry than anything else in the list. Um, they've also got open order, so can turn at the end with their fast cavalry rule. They can march and use that open order rule. They've got fire and flee, so when you use their short bows, they can flee. And they've got feigned flight, so they can fire, flee, and auto rally, which is really useful because they're only leadership six, right? Um, and I've, I've found these really useful. With it being able to just move up eight, and then I can blast a hole in something with um, like with a trebuchet or cannon, some archers, or I can charge a unit of skirmishers with some knights, that then frees up my mounted yeoman with their reserve move to move past that point that was being blocked in the shooting phase um, and allows me to just basically nip around the enemy army. It's also really useful, I found, having a unit of cavalry that can keep up with my knights that I don't care about so much. I don't mind getting them in the way of my opponent's units. I don't. I can charge block and force someone to charge this unit by not running away, not care if they die, and now my knights have got a flank charge. And if my opponent doesn't do that, well, you've just stood there for a turn and I'm happy in this deadlock with my trebuchets. So it is really nice to have a unit you don't care about. It's something that I really got into in my chaos list, where I had my fast cav, and then in that I'd have warhounds as well, and just having those warhounds that you just don't care if they die is so useful for, for skirmisher hunting, light cav hunting, march blocking, even just there's been times where just dropping in deployment a small unit you put them down and you don't give anything away about your battle plan i suppose it's the same as the the squires or peasant archers you just drop them down and you don't care about them if they die but these have got the speed to be able to then do something else not just be plonked down and then left on the edges of the table so he's actually a really useful unit i'd i'd recommend one an army at least um, you might find use for more, but I would recommend at least one an army for something that, Christ, even if you just want to block a charge of a dragon into your artillery, I did that a couple of games ago by just putting them too close for the dragon to actually get its base into the artillery. Um, so it was forced to charge me omen, and then my artillery got an extra turn of shooting. So finally for the list, we get the trebuchet for 100 points. Now... I have had absolutely zero success placing a trebuchet out of line of sight. I would 100% recommend putting them on hills because scattering when you roll a hit and taking off a measly ballistic skill of two just, just doesn't work. It's just done absolutely nothing for me. So the actual field trebuchet stats... 72 inch range is good. You've got a strength 5 and 10. Uh, 10 for anyone that's hold. An AP 1 or 4 for anyone that's hold. With multiple wounds, D3 plus 1 is an incredibly good just all round war machine. It's a lot scarier than most stone throwers. It's 100 points is around the price of most other stone throwers. Um, and although you can't move it, when does anyone move artillery anyway, really? Like, it's a very, very small number of times. So, I think it's a solid war machine. Just be mindful that you are a peasant with ballistic skill too. Um, 
and just don't care too much if it dies because you're on a hill um, and your opponent's got cannons. So yeah, with that, that is the Bretonian list. If you want a bit more Bretonians, there will be an Arcane Journal coming out. If you want the Arcane Journal now, along with other The Old World guides, that will be available immediately on Patreon, and the Arcane Journal will be available in a couple of days on general release. So there will be that as well. Hopefully you've enjoyed it. If you liked this long format guide rather than a more truncated like magic items list and things like that, do let me know in the comments because I want to know how you guys want these videos presented and this has been a very long format video. Other than that, there is a podcast version of these videos available to Patreons along with early access to both Tuesday talking videos and guides as well as any battle reports. So I think up there now is Necromunda. We've got some Ogre Kingdoms versus Chaos for the Old World, as well as a 30k battle report. Um, and you'll be getting the next week's talking video immediately. Um, with that, hopefully you've enjoyed it. We'll see you in a bit. See you in the next one. Mm -hmm.